Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to be with us today and welcome to the in-house council forum program and our sixth webinar in the series. My name is Shuprotim Chakraborty and I'm a partner in Khaitan and Company's Corporate and Commercial Practice Group. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to this webinar to every one of you, whether you are in the audience in India or around the world. Let's talk about the webinar agenda now. The in-house council forum program, as you all know, is designed to provide training and education in legal operations, business management, and uh, substantive law relevant to general counsel and their in-house counsel teams, as well as a discussion forum on contemporary issues relevant to the in-house community in India, like the present one. As you know, our subject today is what every in-house counsel needs to know about AI. On the slide uh, now is the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, in summary, we will have four expert presentations by the partner of Ketan and Company, followed by a question answer session with the audience questions. Uh, we have already received several audience questions. Uh, if you do have any further questions though, please submit them using the facility that has been provided in this webinar portal. If we cannot uh, cover all the questions during the webinar, we will be responding offline by email after the webinar. Be rest assured about that. Also, please note that a copy of the presentation, summary notes of the discussion, and a recording of this webinar will be sent to you after the webinar as a matter of course. Let's start with the introduction of the webinar now. The topic of this webinar is, of course, very, very, very important for everyone, including Indian General Counsel and their team members, because artificial intelligence is no longer a concept of the future. It's a reality reshaping industries and legal departments alike, from contract analysis to legal research. AI is revolutionizing how lawyers work in day-to-day -day life, right? Um, so AI poses a huge opportunity for in-house counsel, but at the same time, a huge, unique challenge to harness AI's power while mitigating its risks. So this webinar will equip you with essential knowledge and understanding to navigate this new complex landscape, covering issues such as AI regulation, data privacy aspects of AI, data governance, and uh, intellectual property. In a nutshell, our objective today is to help you better understand artificial intelligence and the risk that it presents to in-house counsels, uh, to better equip you for the challenge that you may face in your day-to-day -day working life. Uh, let me start with the panel introduction right now. Um, everyone who has registered for this webinar should have received by email already a summary of the panel members and uh, their credentials to talk on today's topic. So I will not spend too much time on that. Suffice to say that uh, they are all experts in their subject matter and qualified to express views on these issues. On our panel today, we are joined by our partners, Harsh Walia, Shailendra Bhandari, and Tanu Banerjee. Harsh Walia is a partner in our TMT practice with extensive expertise and experience in data privacy, and he's also a telecommunications sector expert. Shailendra Bhandari is a partner in our intellectual property practice with special interest in intellectual property aspects of artificial intelligence. Tanu Banerjee is a partner in our corporate practice with expertise and experience in data governance and in, is an, also an expert, of course, on media and technology laws. And I'm a partner, as I mentioned, of corporate practice, and I co-lead the technology group and data privacy cybersecurity practice. So with that, let's jump on to the presentation. Like I was mentioning, uh, we'll have four presentations. The first presentation will be by me, and I will talk about regulation of AI, how the you know world is looking at regulating AI and possibly the route that could be taken by India. The second presentation will be by Hirsch and he will cover privacy and security aspects of artificial intelligence. The third presentation will be by Shailendra uh, on intellectual property aspects of AI and fourth by Tanu on governance aspects of AI. So with that, I think let's straight away jump on to the first presentation, uh, which I will be uh, making. Um, so, like I was mentioning, we'll cover uh, global approaches of AI to AI regulation and the possible approach that India could be taking. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the route map that we will follow. We'll talk about the global approach and also a bit about the EU AI Act, which is one of the most structured laws in play right now. And uh, you, we need to know about it. And I'll tell you in, in a bit why we need to talk about it, right? 
And the second part is India's possible approach to regulating AI. Okay. Um, with that, we can move to the next slide. So as we are you know, aware that every, every jurisdiction is trying to now uh, regulate AI or at least thinking of regulating AI and they are at different stages. We try to probably oversimplify the approaches that are being taken by uh, some of these prominent jurisdictions. EU uh, is taking a risk-based approach and in this presentation today, we'll try and talk a little more about it. Um, UK is taking a rather principles-based approach, okay? Uh, not really going granular into the technology, et cetera. They will give thumb rules uh, and that's basically principles-based approach. Uh, in, on a very broad basis. US is taking a market-driven approach, whilst China, as we are all aware, is largely probably taking a state security-led approach. Now, India is a very is at a very tricky spot, I would say, and, and we are observing some oscillating thought process, but probably we could see that they are trying to regulate outcomes. So it's too early a day, and let's we also have certain slides on that. Let's talk in greater detail as we move on. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, let's talk about the objectives of the European Union's AI Act, EU AI Act. The reason why we should talk about the EU AI Act's objective is probably some learnings from the GDPR. We saw how important those objectives were to keep in mind as we peeled uh, the nuances of uh, law like, you know, uh, the GDPR. So firstly, the objective is to ensure that AI systems are safe and respect public rights and values. Uh, provides legal certainty to facilitate investment and innovation in AI systems, enhances uh, governance and effective enforcement of ethics and safety requirements, uh, facilitates the development of a single EU market, lawful, safe, trustworthy AI uh, applications while preventing market fragmentation. If you see some of these are, I would say, pro-innovation, um, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, probably some of the lessons learned from the regulations of the past. So with that, we can move to the next slide, which I think is the most important slide that you should be considering when you are looking at the EU AI Act, which is the risk based approach. Now, if you see, there are largely four categories. OK, the topmost, if you see, is the prohibited category as far as uh, artificial intelligence is concerned, and it's uh, basically unacceptable risk. What could be some of those examples? Some examples could be say, uh, behavioral manipulation or um, social scoring by public authorities, which we have seen in certain jurisdictions, um, AI evaluating persons, social standing, etc. The second one is a high risk category, which is, again, a very important category because it is not prohibited, but it is subject to certain stringent requirements. Uh, an example for that could be the use of AI for hiring purposes, which is becoming quite rampant in even in India, okay, and in our day-to-day -day hiring and firing processes. Third category is limited risk, which is subject only to light touch regulation. Some of these examples could be chatbots that we interact with, certain kinds of, you know, deep fakes, etc. And lastly is the minimal risk category, which is largely unregulated. This could be spam filters, AI-enabled video games, etc., etc. So that's, in a nutshell, what they're trying to regulate in a... Uh, a as a risk-based approach to, to the uh, lawmaking. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. So if you look at this, why should Indians be bothered? Why should we be bothered? You know, why Indian businesses really need to look at this so closely, right? Uh, we are all aware that AI Act, the EU AI Act applies generally to deployers, importers, distributors, and manufacturers of AI system in the EU. However, there is also a bit of extraterritorial applicability possible. And we're just trying to send some such examples, which we will show you in the next slide. So how is it applicable to someone outside? Uh, and the last two bullet points are important here, therefore. Such businesses, places, or puts into service AI systems within the EU market, or output produced by such businesses using AI system is used within the EU. Let's take two simple, very simple examples. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please to understand how this could be playing out in real life scenario, right? The first example is a company in the European Union sends data to an AI provider in, the, in India to filter European CVs for a job vacancy in the EU. 
the Indian company uses AI to process the data and then sends to the output back to the company in the EU for use. Now, if you look at this, since output is used to provide service in the EU, the AI provider who's in India may be bound to comply with certain obligations in the EU AI Act. The second example is, uh, is pertaining to the previous second bullet point that we saw. A, say a high-risk AI system is developed in India and it is integrated into a product and just taking an example of a connected vehicle, then it is sold in the EU. Now, in this case, also the EU Act will apply and uh, to, the, to the Indian provided AI system. So I hope that we have been able to throw some light as to how it could be applicable to Indian entities as well. We can move to the next slide and talk about how India has been looking towards regulating artificial intelligence. I uh, will probably take a very unique approach and the good and bad part is that we have got some examples that we have seen already across the globe. We'll probably learn from them and take a very unique approach. Next slide, please. We are aware of this uh, controversial advisories that came out, right? On the 1st of March, 2024, and 16th of March 2024, which kind of had overridden the first March advisory. These advisories were issued by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, and it gave certain diktat to intermediaries and platforms. Now, mind you, intermediaries are defined very broadly under the Information Technology Act. In a very crude sense, they are basically supposed to be dumb pipelines or dumb containers where they are not originating any information they are not changing anything uh, whilst the information is in transit and also they are not selecting uh, you know the end user and now when you look at an ai system it may not squarely fall within an, within an intermediary concept also interestingly there is no definition of platforms but nonetheless this advisory was issued and if you look at it um, certain things which were called out there is, you know, so the example, restriction on use of prohibited information, which is already enumerated in the intermediary rules as to what you are supposed to put out in the open, what you cannot, uh, etc. Then the second one is steps to prevent bias uh, and also uh, in the integrity and electoral process, it should not be impacting, etc. A uh, clear communication to the users about consequences of dealing with unlawful information. Uh, appropriate labeling of information that may be used as misinformation or deep fake. And then there were two very controversial points in the previous advisory, which was issued uh, on the 1st of March. Firstly, uh, it was explicit approval of the government before using or making available under tested or unreliable AI tools in India, uh, which kind of sent a shockwave that are we, are we going towards a license Raj? Uh, thankfully, this got deleted in the later uh, advisory. And also, uh, this next point was filing of action taken report by organizations, which also got deleted. But right now, what we still have is that if it is under tested and unreliable AI tools, then you'll have to do appropriate labeling. The biggest question is in today's day and age, what is under tested and unreliable AI system is kind of unknown. It's not really defined, so to say. Uh, and probably every other AI system could be considered to be one. So uh, I think one of the practical way forward is that uh, the consent pop up, etc., which the government has talked about in this advisory to be mentioning very clearly that, they, that this is not infallible, there could be errors, etc. That should be very prominently called out whenever we are having an AI in play. Can we move to the next slide, please? Also, we are going to cover at the end the upcoming Digital India Act, which is in the making, which will probably replace the Information Technology Act of today and would become the mother umbrella legislation of technology. What are the probably top three takeaways which we can perceive from the conversation that we have had with the ministry, with the minister in the past? Uh, how would they probably regulate AI? Firstly, they might be creating an overarching umbrella terminology of emerging technologies rather than only talking about AI. So first point is prohibition of de development and deployment of harmful emerging technologies. Second important put, uh, point could be right to be informed about technological decision making and right to opt out of such decision making. And the third pillar could be protection from biased or discriminatory treatment owing to technological decision making. That's what we are probably looking forward to. So in a nutshell, what we covered today in my presentation is 
how world over some of the prominent jurisdictions are trying to regulate artificial intelligence uh, how india should and why india should be bothered about such a development uh, you know called the eu ai act how it can have extraterritorial ramifications and the third is what india could be looking forward to as law making as far as ai is concerned so with that i'll close my presentation and i will now hand this over to harsh harsh would be covering privacy and security aspects of artificial intelligence over to you harsh thank you very much supratim for the wonderful presentation uh, i'll be talking about artificial intelligence and how it is related to privacy and security uh, this is a road map of what i'll be covering today uh, first of all let us look at some of the machine learning fundamentals so that we can draw a relationship between uh, data and machine learning second we'll look at how data protection and ai are related what are the conflicts between these two third we will look at some of the security risk in ai specifically from a privacy lens and finally how best to mitigate those risk related to privacy next slide please so before moving on to the fundamentals uh, this is a very simple definition i found on ai and thought of sharing with everybody that it is simply a technology that helps solve complex tasks which otherwise would have required human intervention and the usage of ai could be multiple types it could be used by government for formation of policies it could be used by healthcare sector to predict illness or it could be used by various functions of a business for uh, growth and development next slide please so what are the fundamentals of machine learning let us look at some of the uh, basic fundamentals what goes into machine learning so there are three main models of machine learning the first one is supervised learning where a labeled data set is used as input and a correlation is drawn with the output through these examples and correlation the machine learning takes place and this is one of the most common kind of machine learning process second is supervised unsupervised learning where the data sets are not labeled and this is mainly used for grouping kind of exercise outlier data is identified by machines and this generally is used to identify patterns and finally there is reinforced learning which means the data is an interaction with virtual or real environments this is a trial and error met method and it takes a lot of time to for machine learning in this kind of process next slide please now let us look at some of the functions of ai based on output so generally these are the three kinds of output you will get from ai one is recommendatory for example if you want to know which articles you will like maybe the ai model can help you with that through your past learning habits and suggest articles which will be of interest to you similarly it could be classificatory where it can help you distinguish between a spam email versus a legitimate email and finally predict prediction is one of the important functions of ai a bank can use it to understand what is the possibility of a loan default for an individual basis the data available with it uh, next slide please now let us look at how do businesses see ai and what are the most common uses of ai so you will usually see that companies are deploying ai for customer service requirements so we all have chatted with a chatbot for example or call the call center and there is a uh, robot that is answering our calls all that is ai based there could be fraud management supply chain management where ai can be helpful and similarly there could be product recommendations that ai can give in future uh, where do businesses see the main concerns they see that because of ai there could be over dependence on technology and there could be a privacy risk as well we will look at what those risks are in more detail in the coming slides next slide please now let us uh, look at the interconnection between big data personal data and machine learning so big data is the entire universe of data consisting of both human as well as non human data personal data is a subset of this big data this personal data is for various reasons 
used in machine learning model. Once the machine learning model is ready, it is applied on new set of data to draw inference about individuals. And these inferences finally become part of big data. And it is kind of a circular interdependence between these three you will find everywhere. Uh, next slide, please. So now let us look at what is the conflict between data protection and AI. So first of all, consent. Consent is a basis of processing and widely recognized in almost all data protection legislations. But consent has to be free, specific, informed, unconditional. By most of the legislation, this is a requirement. The conflict with AI here is that it is very difficult to explain AI and what it does to the data or personal data. And therefore, it is usually the case that the informed consent is very difficult to take in case of AI. What could be probable solution? Different legislations will have different solutions. For example, GDPR has legitimate interest as one of the criteria for or grounds for processing. In India, we don't have it, but publicly available personal data is exempt under the Digital Personal Data Protection Act of India. And there are certain exemptions for research, archival, and statistical purposes as well. Second is purpose limitation, which means PD should only be used uh, for which for purposes for which it was collected in the first place. Now, AI will generally reuse PD for various purposes, and this purpose may not match with the original purpose. That is how AI works. And therefore, the best way to do it is un under some of the legislations of data protection, there is an alignment. You will have to see whether there is an alignment of the original purpose and the new purpose. Some legislations will not allow this kind of al uh, alignment, in which case uh, users will need to be updated periodically. And it could also be possible that consent may need to be taken again in certain cases. Next slide, please. Now, the other conflict area could be data minimization. It is a concept available under all uh, legislations on data protection. So use limited PD is the concept. Whereas AI always de depends on vast amount of data for its training and learning. Then there are certain AI models which will continuously gather data. Therefore, data minimization becomes a little difficult to manage with AI. But probably the solution could be that more focused data collection can be undertaken when you are dealing with personal data. You should try to process personal data only if it is necessary for that process. Otherwise, not use personal data at all. And there should be robust deletion policies as well available with you. Fourth is there are number of rights that data principal or individual gets under data protection laws. Access rights, right to know how my information is being processed, right to erasure are some of these rights. Now, AI with AI, it becomes very difficult to give those access rights to individuals because of the complexity of data management involved. There are a lot of places from which the data is coming and it is getting stored at third party locations as well. So this becomes a little bit of a problem. And similarly, erasure also becomes a problem because in some of the AI models, personal data is embedded with, within it. So the best way to deal with it is whenever you are using PD in AI, try to build a, a see the AI life cycle and track PD where it, wherever it is being used. Properly indexed PD usage should be done in AI system so that it can be tracked later on easily. Uh, next slide, please. Now, let us look at some of the security risk that uh, AI offers, specifically because uh, of privacy concerns that are there. So the first one is training data. The training data is vast amount of data coming from various sources and getting stored at various third party locations. So obviously it increases the security risk and vulnerability to all those places. Uh, security risk will have to be tackled at various levels in AI deployment. Secondly, very few organizations will create their own ML framework. It is generally seen that there is third party dependence for this and sometimes and most often rather uh, open source software are used. So 
there are a lot of vulnerabilities that adds because of this if you look at a standard ml framework according, according to one research there are more than 850000 of lines of code that is written in it and there are more than 150 dependencies so it obviously increases the security risk then there are various type of attacks uh, concerning privacy in ai models some of them i have listed here for example model inversion attack is one where the output can be accessed and using that the input could be found by an attacker and this obviously can lead to privacy uh, leakage or personal data being leaked membership inference attack is another attack where the individual whose data went into the training could be identified by attackers white box black box attacks are also very common adversarial attacks are where uh, a perturbation is introduced in the system so that wrong predictions is given by an AI tool. So these are some of the attacks that you will usually see in AI. Next slide, please. Now, how best to deal with these risks uh, from a privacy point of view? First is if anonymized data is utilized for training and for other purposes or de-identified data is used, I think that is helpful in terms of uh, data leakage, uh, controlling all of that. Uh, data minimization we have already spoken about. Uh, privacy enhancing techniques these days are being used, also called PET techniques. So there are various types of PETs. Uh, the first one is perturbation, for example, where some type of deviation is deliberately induced in the system so that even if there is data leak, the actual data is not uh, compromised. Synthetic data is artificial data created through data synthesis algorithms. It has some relationship with the original data, but the actual data is never uh, compromised in this case. Federated data is another technique where a lot of individuals or companies are working on a similar model, uh, machine learning model. And what they do is they don't share their data with each other, but share the final uh, ML model so that there is a global uh, flavor to it but at the same time if it is compromised that actual data is not compromised and then there are various type of smpc techniques also to enhance privacy uh, or reduce privacy risk finally there are data protection toolkits that are available in this even before deployment the entire ai life cycle is thought through properly from the stage of inception to the stage of understanding what all data will go into the machine learning process how it will be used and the decommissioning of the ai system what are the risks involved at each life cycle stage and how best to deal with it through data minimization or through various pet techniques so all this should be planned accordingly under a toolkit uh, next slide please so what have we seen during this presentation today is that AI is essential for creation of value in big data. AI should be deployed thoughtfully because there is an inherent conflict between the principles of privacy and AI. And finally, businesses should be able to balance the inno innovation and compliance. And this is where in-house councils can help business achieve this balance. With this, I'll end my presentation and uh, hand it over back to Suprutin. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh. What a wonderful presentation. And I can clearly see from the engagement that we are getting from the audience. There's a lot of questions which are coming in. And maybe before I hand this over to Shailendra, there's just one question which uh, I think we should ask right now to you. Uh, you've spoken about the conflict between consent and AI in your presentation. Now, the question is, can AI truly operate on the basis of informed consent, right? given the complexity of data usages? Right. So uh, very good question. In fact, uh, it's very difficult to imagine that there will be informed consent in case of AI. So what is the solution? I think today it's very difficult to say, but I think slowly the concept of uh, consent itself will evolve there will be, instead of informed consent, there could be other kind of consents or genuine consents that will evolve. Now, what is genuine consent? Where a deliberate, genuine 
effort is made by a data fiduciary to give information to the data principals or individuals. How best to do it? There are various ways. The first one is give information in plain and simple language. So if simple language is used, no jargons are used, maybe individuals are able to understand what their data is being put through and what will be the benefit or risk involved in that. Second, there could be a layered consent concept that could come in. So there will be different levels of detailing that will go into explaining what the consent is meant for. So somebody not wanting to know too much detail can look at a basic level or a, somebody could look at intermediate level of detailing or an advanced level of detailing. And then there could be a dynamic consent uh, rather than a static consent which takes place just once. So as data is used for various other purposes, there could be consent requirements that the AI system can itself trigger and get those consents from individuals. So I think slowly the concept will evolve and it will take care of the concerns as far as informed consent is concerned. I hope it answers your question, Supratim. Yes, yes, it does. And thank you so much, Harsh, once again for the wonderful presentation and for responding to the question. Uh, Shailendra, we'll move to you now. Um, the whole world is intending to know about intellectual property aspects of AI and uh, you know I'm sure we are going to have a very good learning uh, session uh, with you over to you Shalindra. Thank you Shupratim and great presentation Harsh I think uh, two, two most insightful presentation and I'm privileged to work with both of you on various aspects of AI. Uh, can we move to the first slide please uh, the introduction slide please. So in terms of what I'm going to discuss today I think two important aspects. First is obviously whether AI tools can be considered as inventors or authors of uh, a, a certain copyright work or a patent uh, which is being filed. Second aspect is the registrability of AI outputs, whether AI outputs can be registered uh, and do they have the, the thresholds of novelty or originality under the Copyright Act. Third is on the infringement issues and I think which is the most talked about uh, aspect if you see in the media that infringement issues related to AI are creating problems because concept is new as such and no one really knows how the law will evolve uh, going forward and then few takeaways as a conclusion uh, which we would just discuss can we move to the next slide please so in terms of authorship and inventorship I think we have uh, our very own Indian case uh, and that too from a fellow Indian attorney uh, Mr. Ankit Sahani who tested out uh, the, the overall authorship of a certain AI output called Suryast. So what you see on screen is, uh, uh, is the base image of uh, the first, first image is the base image of uh, what Ankit Sahani had used, uh, followed by the starry diet of uh, Vincent Van Gogh, which he used as a style image, which eventually created an output, which you see as the third image, which he named as Suryast. If you see the output, there is there is some similarity with the Van Gogh uh, uh, Van Gogh uh, Starry Nights picture, with the certain blue color scheme which you see there. But the output is not that substantially. Uh, re uh, it's not a substantial reproduction of the uh, of the two inputs which you see on the screen. Uh, Ankit Sahani tried to register this uh, uh, with various uh, uh, copyright offices around the world, uh, including India, U.S., Canada. And we'll see that in the next slide. Uh, and if I may just, just request to move to the next slide, please. In India, it was registered because India does not have a substantive examination process when it comes to the copyright registration. Uh, copyright Office realized later that probably the, the AI uh, authorship, which was claimed within the application, had dual uh, authors. One was of, uh, obviously Mr. Sahani, and the second one was his Raghav painting app, which is basically the AI tool, which was named as the co-author. Uh, once it came out in the media, Copyright Office realized that, okay, there's some issue and probably there is no room for having a unnatural person being registered as a co-author. And they sent out a withdrawal notice. And now presently that the status is in a limbo because Mr. Sahani has also challenged that. In US, it was again rejected because it said the, the US office said that it lacked human intervention. And in Cam Canada, again, because there was no substantive examination process, the work was registered. 
Similarly for patents, uh, Stephen Thaler's Davos AI tool has also made news. And except for South Africa, rest of the jurisdiction which you see on the screen have rejected such uh, uh, registration for AI tool based inventorship. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? In terms of registrability, uh, I think few considerations uh, going by the the rigid old rule, I, if I may say so, in terms of copyright, obviously, originality is the key aspect which decides on the registrability. Now, if if you consider an AI tool, uh, the first thought which comes to your mind is that there is no originality because you're basing it or on, on a certain original work and you're creating a derivative work out of a certain base work which is created. So are derivative works capable of being registered under the Copyright Act? That's a question mark. Uh, and be in the in the coming slides, we'll see whether there are any other considerations which could afford such a protection. In terms of trademarks, imagine using the same AI tool uh, for, say, creating logos. And there could be two competing companies who may use the same AI tool to create an output or a trademark logo, which may may or may not have a certain distinctiveness level because eventually the training data which is being used by the AI tool will be the same and the output could be probably similar and you could have similar logos being thrown out as an output so that's another consideration when you use ai tools for creating logos in terms of patents again i think a uh, few test cases here uh us again it was rejected because it lacked human intervention in germany although uh, the davos decision said that okay you can't have a registration for ai based invention but subsequently, Germany has allowed uh, to register an AI-based invention, provided it has natural persons being named as inventors. In India, obviously, we have our own set of problems when it comes to software per se not being patentable. And uh, we've seen the Delhi High Court also sending certain directives and guidance notes to the government, stating that it is probably likely to uh, create problems from an India perspective because you're not getting that many number of inventions being registered, which are AI based. Because this rule, to a certain uh, extent, is rigid to say that, okay, because it's software based, you can't have a registration for patents. Can we move to the next slide, please? The third one, I think, uh, is in relation to infringement. And this is the most talked about uh, uh, aspect when it comes uh, to discussions around the world. And, and infringement, it can occur at the training data stage and the output stage. You see the image uh, on the screen from Getty Images. Uh, Stable AI uh, happened to uh, be, uh, be attacked by Getty Images because their, their images were being used as part of the training data. And what output which, uh, which people got from uh, the training data was with the watermark of Getty Images. So you have two sets of problems here. You have the training data, which is which is basically a copyright issue, which you see because these images have been used without authorization from Getty Images. And then you also have the trademark infringement aspect because the watermark of Getty Images also was thrown out as an output. Second uh, is the trademark logos as outputs, which we just spoke about in terms of distinctiveness and similar logos being thrown out. Third is violation of publicity rights. Now you've seen Anil Kapoor and Arijit Singh going after uh, various uh, online uh, sites where their uh, persona was being used or their voice was being used through AI tools to throw out certain outputs which were not authorized by, two, by these two individuals. You must have also heard about Scarlett Johansson's voice being used by OpenAI uh, in, in their AI tool, which created a lot of furor amongst the media. And of course, she didn't have file any case after that but her her voice or the likeness of that voice was used by open ai which created issues as such automatic prompts for competing brands is again an issue which one needs to consider say you must have seen when you type your emails there are certain automatic prompts which also come uh, as part of this uh, entire thing which is thrown out as part of ai similarly uh, say you're using a google ad service and you you happen to get a prompt for a competing brand, which is an AI based uh, prompt, it is likely to create certain infringement issues around it. Deep fakes, I, I won't discuss that. I think that's something which is very common and you see it in the media. 
And the last aspect is the contributory infringement. Who all are in, uh, responsible for infringement? Is it the, the person who's actually creating the prompt? Is it the person who gets the output? Or is the person who has actually created the AI tool, uh, whether he or she is responsible for it? Because there is a likelihood that the AI tool may also be held responsible as part of the contributory infringement. And that raises a lot of questions from what we have discussed uh, in, in the earlier slides. Can we move to the next slide, please? In terms of questions, I think uh, if, if AI works are not uh, given protection, would you say that, okay, they fall in the public domain for lack of protection? Well, that's dangerous, right? Because there could be situations where AI works may have a certain element of uh, uh, labor skill and money being uh, included in it, which affords certain kind of protection. Can mere storage of machine learning lead to infringement if the output is not a substantial reproduction? Now, imagine that you, your human mind, you're obviously storing something which you read. Likewise, when it comes to machine learning, there is bound to be some learning which is picked up or which is scraped from uh, the learnings which uh, the machine would learn. Is that something which can be considered as infringement when the human mind is not considered to be infringing if, if it stores in their mind? So that's a question which, which, will, uh, which will evolve and the law should also evolve on those lines. Then who all should be considered as authors? Is the person who's actually creating the prompt and creating the output should be considered the author of the work? Or do you think the AI tool owner should also be considered for joint authorship? Because eventually it's the software which will uh, be used in creation of that output. Test of trademark infringement is also likely to change. Uh, the typical test has been that it, it, is, it is a question of an average person or, or average consumer of imperfect recollection. If AI has to replace the uh, consumer mind, and if AI has to decide or suggest certain brands or certain products whilst purchasing on, say, an online retail site, is there a possibility of the consumer using his or her mind? Or it's a question of AI using uh, the mind to prompt you with certain things. Now, that test of our average consumer of imperfect recollection is likely to change if AI has to take over. Let's move to the next slide, please. So in terms of takeaways uh, from the overall uh, discussions which we had, I think the first thing which uh, we need to consider is, is whether law amendment is necessary. And I would say yes. Imagine, say, the term of copyright, which is presently uh, is, is based on the life of the author. But when it comes to an AI tool, if AI tool has to be given that kind of protection in terms of authorship, there is no life. So the Copyright Act is presently not ready to handle that. Similarly, when it comes to the patentability aspect, uh, like what Delhi High Court in the Open TV case suggested, that there has to be a certain evolution of law if uh, AI has to be the next thing which uh, which is obviously software based and software per se is not patentable then certain changes are required and that rigidity needs to come down a bit in terms of authorship and inventorship i think what we have seen and i think the right way forward according to me is a natural person should be entitled for authorship and probably ai tools it's not the right time to make the ai tools as authors or inventors Review of terms and conditions of AI tool are also very much necessary. And that's on two sides. I would say it's also necessary from uh, the perspective of the person who's creating the AI tool because their disclaimers are very important so as to get yourself out from uh, the question of whether the AI tool is responsible for a prompter's uh, uh, infringing prompt which is being made. And from the prompter's perspective, so we, I had an interesting discussion with my cousin the other day. She she happens to be a designer. Now she was using this well-known uh, software, which is which enjoys a dominant position, I would say. And she being a designer, she happened to just go through the terms and condition. And one of the terms and condition mentioned that her works could be used for training, for creating certain AI works or to create outputs out of AI works. Now, that was a startling revelation because if, if her work, which is an original work, was to be put within the software uh, learning process, it's a problem. 
because eventually you may have outputs which are similar to her original works. So to that extent, review of terms and conditions from the prompters or the people who are using the AI tool are also equally important. Permission should be sought before using any training data from an original work. And I think that's that's an obvious thing because authorized and unauthorized uh, uh, use of data is, is something which is, is anyway enshrined within the act. Freedom to operate or infringement analysis is again an important aspect. You, you just can't think of just creating an output, thinking that if the output is being thrown out by an AI tool, it will be distinctive or it will be original. You need to conduct those freedom to operate analysis or infringement analysis before you take a call whether such a thing can be used or not. And last is that, and this is something which we have seen in the recent past, is that there are several transactions which are taking place where AI technologies are being acquired. And when you acquire an AI technology, the representations and warranties become that much more important. Obviously, the infringement warranty is something which is most important that you don't want to acquire a technology which is likely to infringe on someone else's right. Second thing is the, the heart of uh, any AI tool is the machine learning or the training data. The warranty should be sought that such machine learning and training data is permitted to be being used for a longer duration. Because if that is taken out by people who have allowed the AI tool to use it, the entire AI tool is likely to fall. So I think these are few takeaways uh, uh, from, from what I discussed earlier. Uh, and I would now pass it on to my colleague Tanu, who will talk about governance on AI. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Shailendra. Wonderful presentation. And I think, uh, I think many of the questions would have been answered. Uh, but before we move on to Tanu, uh, I think there are, again, a number of questions on IP. You can understand the, the level of interest that is there. And I'll just pick up one of them before I hand this over to Tanu. Um, the question is, what steps should we take to address potential intellectual property issues related to AI development and use? So I think uh, one of the important things is that an infringement analysis is something which is very much important. And uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the authorship and inventorship, I think that is something which is very much important when it comes to who will own that particular AI tool and whether that AI tool is likely to create any infringement issues uh, due to lack of authorization for training data, et cetera. So I think these two components, I would, I would say, are most important. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, Shailendra, wonderful presentation, uh, great answer. Tanu, we'll move to you. I think you're going to cover, I would say, one of the most important thing what in-house councils need to know, AI governance, right? Which is, I would say, a headache, a problem, a confusion that is now very hot. So over to you, Tanu. Thanks, Upratim. And uh, I'm afraid uh, after Shalindra's discussion on artists and uh, celebrities, global celebrities, this quite might sound a bit serious. Uh, but like you said, it is uh, it is a very crucial aspect to consider for everyone today in the ecosystem. Uh, let's begin. Uh, you know, greetings to everyone first of all, and thank you so much for listening so far. Uh, AI governance is a is a critical aspect of ensuring that AI tools are developed and used responsibly, ethically, um, etc. And given the pace of AI advancement today, governance frameworks need to address a range of challenges. Some of these we've spoken about uh, in our previous segments. But in this last segment, I'll talk about uh, some of the major broader challenges and risks around AI, uh, some strategies to mitigate them, um, and how stakeholders can play a significant role in setting up governance systems. Could we move to the next slide, please? Now, to start with, some of the ethical concerns around AI are bias and discrimination, lack of transparency, and autonomous decision making. Now, what does this mean? Uh, in terms of bias, AI systems can perpetuate and sometimes even amplify existing biases that are present in training data, which can then lead to discriminatory or sometimes even unwanted outcomes. Lack of transparency, which is you know, we also call it the black box problem, 
Now, many AI models, particularly deep learning systems, operate in ways that are not easy to interpret, which makes it difficult to understand their decision making process also. And then there's autonomous decision making uh, where AI systems can make decisions without human intervention, which would then raise ethical concerns around accountability in the context of potential harm that an erroneous decision could cause. Uh, for example, let's say in a critical area uh, such as healthcare, uh, an incorrect decision could have a direct impact on a patient. Uh, and therefore, uh, identifying accountability in this context is also crucial. Now, how do we work around these ethical concerns? Firstly, by implementing algorithms that are designed based on fairness in the first place, uh, by regularly auditing AI systems for reducing any inherent bias, uh, developing explainable AI models that allow stakeholders to understand and interpret AI-based decisions, um, so that they can uh, implement these decisions effectively as well. And lastly, ensuring human oversight in AI decision making, especially where uh, stakes are high or matters are critical. The second bucket of challenges would be regulatory and legal risks. Now, the examples here are firstly regulatory uncertainty. The pace at which AI is developing today surpasses the speed at which existing legal and regulatory frameworks are evolving which then leads to uncertainty for businesses and individuals in terms of compliance. Uh, and then our existing legal frameworks lack any demarcation on assignment of liability across AI developers, deployers, and end users. And then therefore determining responsibility for AI driven decisions is quite complex. And often it's unclear, especially where a harm is caused or there is a malfunction. Now, regulatory uncertainty can perhaps be addressed by regular engagement with regulators and policymakers that can help shape a more effective AI regulatory framework, uh, staying informed about legal developments from time to time. Then developing internal compliance frameworks that anticipate future regulatory requirements and you know, putting in place these frameworks well in time. Uh, and then in the context of distribution of liability, establishing clear lines of res responsibility even within the organization for decisions that are uh, based on uh, AI outcomes. Could we move to the next slide, please? The next larger concern is data protection and security. Now, developing AI systems often require vast amounts of data, which then raises concerns about how data is collected, how is it stored, uh, is there use of personal data. Uh, and also, once an AI tool is deployed, keeping sensitive data secure is often a challenge if protocols of consents or restrictions on data transfer, etc., are not followed at the ground level. Uh, there is, of course, the massive threat of cybersecurity since AI systems can be vulnerable to cyber attacks. And malicious actors can manipulate inputs and cause the AI tool to make incorrect and harmful decisions. To deal with this, some of the countermeasures could be implementing robust data governance policies, which could include policies for minimizing in inputs of sensitive data, anonymization, um, and focusing on compliance with data protection regulations. And then enhancing cybersecurity measures, which are specific to AI, uh, being prepared for effectively handling an adversarial attack, uh, and setting up systems that can detect an anomaly well in time so that it can be rectified uh, in time as well. In terms of ethical and social impact, now, firstly, Automation of different functions driven by AI can lead to significant job losses. Uh, you know, this is, of course, labor displacement is a topic that is widely discussed, but this can particularly be seen in sectors like manufacturing, logistics, uh, customer services, creative industry, etc. Uh, and secondly, benefits of AI may not be evenly distributed, which can then worsen the existing social and economic inequalities. Uh, for example, concentration of AI amongst a few corporates and governments can create a very unfair advantage for a few players um, and adversely impacts smaller businesses, which are anyway struggling to compete. 
to be prepared for these challenges now what can be helpful is firstly investing in reskilling and upskilling programs uh, for people which can help them transition to newer roles that may be created by ai um, and also designing AI systems and policies that aim to reduce rather than worsen social uh, inequality uh, through inclusive practices or uh, encouraging equal access to AI technologies, etc. Could we move to the next slide, please? Now, from a more global standpoint, one of the biggest threats of AI today is that various nations are increasingly viewing AI as a strategic asset, uh, which leads us to concerns of AI becoming an arms race, where ethical considerations could be sidelined in favor of, uh, let's say, technological supremacy. And then in addition to this, different countries could develop uh, diverging governance frameworks which can then lead to challenges in coordination and cooperation to deal with AI-based threats at a more global level. Now, of course, these sort of issues uh, need a more collaborative efforts at a larger governmental level and perhaps by global business players. Uh, but the right direction to this could firstly be to promote international cooperation on AI governance. Uh, this could be done by encouraging multilateral agreements uh, and uh, promoting forums for similar discussions. Um, a great example of this, in fact, is the OECD AI principles, uh, which are the first intergovernmental standards on AI, and these were adopted by several member countries of OECD. Uh, other than that, we must all, I feel, uh, advocate inclusion of ethical considerations in AI development and uh, at a global scale. Uh, this could go a long way in preventing a monopolization of AI-based technologies. And lastly, uh, the last bucket would be technological risks, uh, which can take form of one, unintended consequences. Uh, AI systems can often behave unpredictably in complex environments, uh, which could lead to unintended or potentially harmful consequences. Um, and also excessive or over-reliance on AI, particularly in uh, critical infrastructure or decision-making, can lead to vulnerabilities if the technology fails or if there is an error in the decision or the outcome uh, and, you know, given, of course, the lack of practical human insight in this decision-making. The best way to perhaps deal with this is to test and validate AI systems thoroughly in diverse scenarios. Uh, to anticipate and mitigate uh, unintended behaviors. Uh, maintaining human oversight at all times, uh, decision-making authority, particularly in critical systems, so that AI tools are used in a way that assist human fun functions rather than replacement of humans. Could we go to the next slide now? Now, as we stand today, the future of AI governance uh, largely depends on collaboration amongst different stakeholders. Um, and I, let's look at what these stakeholders. Uh, now, perhaps the primary participants in the AI landscape are, of course, the developers of AI technology. Um, and what can developers do? Firstly, taking up ownership of the model which means to ensure that the model that is created uh, is lack, uh, there's no breach of data. Uh, there is no aspects of infringement. There are no duplications, etc. cetera. Um, and for, to achieve this uh, periodic tracking of work while an algorithm is being developed is critical because there would be different people developing uh, a single model. Rules and regulations, which would mean implementing a set of rules or internal guidelines around quality of data, uh, proper documentation, ensuring compliance with laws, um, et cetera. Then to put, put in place standards uh, to ensure the quality of training data that is being used from a accuracy and a bias standpoint. Uh, and lastly, continuous monitoring, which means that even once a model is developed, it must be continuously monitored to be sure that it's working as it was intended to be. Next slide, please. Now, the next obvious player in the chain are the enterprises deploying AI tools. Um, and what can enterprises do? 
to start with, uh, priority should be given to adopt AI tools that are compliant with existing laws. Putting in place internal governance policies, for example, policies around ethical use of AI, risk management policies, or even policies around vendor engagement. Uh, for example, uh, you could define eligibility requirements for a vendor to be engaged, uh, terms around data ownership, uh, how would transition be handled, etc. And, you know, the policy framework could cover these aspects. Also, forming oversight and governance committees uh, could be very helpful. Uh, these committees could have expert members who have skills to review and implement strategies. Uh, they could also be periodic training programs for employees so that a general continuous culture can be formed around AI governance. Um, and lastly, of course, uh, uh, drawing up robust contracts uh, for deployment of AI tools with proper contractual remedies. And I think this is perhaps one of the key roles where uh, in-house councils could play a strategic role. Um, next slide, please. Just some concluding remarks before I wrap up this segment. Uh, effective AI governance requires a multifaceted uh, approach that addresses ethical, legal, technological, and societal challenges. Uh, organizations and governments should collaborate uh, to develop comprehensive governance frameworks that balance innovation, but with responsibility. Uh, continuous monitoring, adaptation, and evolve involvement of all stakeholders um, is essential today to navigate through the complex uh, landscape of AI governance. Uh, we also must acknowledge that rapid change in technology uh, is likely to outpace regulatory frameworks, which can, of course, lead to lagging efforts on governance. Um, in fact, balancing innovation with the regulatory framework uh, and making sure that it does not stifle the process of uh, progress of AI, uh, this continues to be uh, a challenge in any case. And finally, of course, the global nature of AI development calls for uh, cooperation at a more international level. Uh, this is, of course, uh, difficult to achieve given everyone has different national interests, different priorities. Uh, but a targeted aim towards this uh, could go a long way. With that, uh, I'd like to conclude our session today and hand it back to Supratip. Thank you, everyone, for listening to us patiently. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Tanu. Uh, amazing presentation again. Um, I'll ask one question and then we'll jump on to the remaining uh, questions that we have been receiving. So from a contractual perspective, uh, what are some of the key things that you should be built into a contract with an AI tool provider? You know, I think when you are in an in-house position, this is a very yeah. important and critical question to consider. Yeah, great question, Supratim. And I think, yeah, from, from uh, you know, the audience that we are addressing today, this is, of course, one of the primary uh, things to perhaps take back. Uh, you know, from a contractual perspective, now there are two players and two sides to this. One is an AI service recipient, uh, and then there is the AI developer. So depending on you know where you are placed, these remedies would uh, differ. But from a recipient's perspective, uh, and, and you know I wouldn't go into details of indemnities and representations, warranties, etc. Those are quite obvious as larger concepts. But to just uh, focus on you know specific uh, remedies that can be sought contractually. Uh, from a recipient's perspective, of course, IP infringement uh, to make sure that the algorithm underlying algorithm is not infringing. Uh, there is no breach of data that has happened in terms of the training data that is used. Uh, there is no unauthorized access uh, to, let's say, an algorithm or data or anything else that has been used to create the model. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, two other critical aspects could be uh, uh, what are the consequences of performance failures uh, if the tool fails uh, and then results in, and which could have you know cascading effects in terms of incorrect decision implementing you know third party liability and so on so you know failure triggering at one point could have literally a dominoes effect in different aspects so uh, covering that depending on you know what is the organization what is the business etc 
and i think glass that i would cover uh, is also to sort of uh, you know understand what is the level of dependence on the tool that is deployed um, and once for some reason the to tool is removed or taken away or withdrawn for whatever reason how are you going to transition to another tool you know there is there a tool that is available is it as effective and if it is then how would you transition from one tool to the other now those are sort of things that should be thought about while while a contract is drawn up uh, from a recipient's perspective of course and then there are the ai developers who are you know licensing or selling these technologies uh, here remedies to think about or triggers to think about could be misuse of the tool maybe the tool is deployed and you know used in a way that it was not intended to be used and then therefore there is a failure and therefore there is an uh, incorrect decision etc or an outcome etc uh, so you know how do you protect your liability against misuse uh, maybe there is uh, you know there are restrictions uh, to be built in uh, you know any tampering with the algorithm itself right uh, because you have access to that algorithm and then what happens if you start altering it um, and you know that then sort of the result or the inaccuracy is because of these alterations it can be very difficult to segregate these things uh, so maybe restrictions on alteration of algor uh, algorithms and then of course contractual breaches and violation of laws uh, and so on uh, business malpractices uh, maybe the organization itself is engaging in uh, in a malpractice, which then affects the AI tool provider as well. Uh, so you know, these are just larger points. Of course, this is a broad topic. I think uh, you know this sort of needs an entire session uh, by itself, but uh, just uh, broadly covering this in a nutshell. Thank you. I think you covered it pretty well. And now I think let's open it up for of all other speakers as well. I'll just go through the list of questions and maybe I'll start uh, taking one by one. Um, Parsha, I think this question probably you could take up. Uh, given the rapid expansion of AI and privacy and increasing privacy concerns, what is your outlook for the future of AI and privacy? Sure. So I think uh, AI will evolve in order to ensure that privacy concerns are taken care of. Uh, there are many ways in which AI is uh, changing and some of those could be uh, privacy is being enhanced because there is local processing more and more taking place these days. What do I mean by it? Uh, local or edge computing is what I can see more and more being used by organizations. So there is no transfer of data from one place to another so that you don't have to rely on any unsecured network. So your pri private or personal data remains in your laptop or in your smartphones, whatever is the edge device that you are using. And then there are decentralized AI models also that are more and more being used. And what I mean by this is that the computing power is not in a centralized server as it was earlier but it is disintegrated, decentralized and kept at various locations where it is not possible to maintain it in the local device so that there is no one single point of failure in the entire chain le leading to a big data leak. So that is another privacy enhancing technique that is being used. Uh, other than this, there are many pets that I have already discussed in my presentation. One of the important pets uh, that is being used these days is homographic encryption so the data that is being analyzed or being used for training is in encrypted form already and the machine works on that encrypted data itself so there is a less lesser possibility of a data leak there but it obviously reduces the speed at which AI operates because it has to operate on encrypted data. So similarly, there are various SMPC techniques also that are there to ensure that one leakage does not mean the leakage of the entire data set. So I think as time goes by, AI will evolve and ensure that privacy is taken care of uh, in, in most of the machine learning processes.
Right. Thank you. Very well said. Um, Shailendra, I think the next one you could pick up. Um, since AI created works are derived from other works, do you think that there should be no IP protection for such works? Uh, I know it may be a controversial answer from my side. Uh, from from the perspective of original uh, owners, or uh, I think they would obviously say that it's derived from their work. But I feel that if the output is not a substantial reproduction of the original work, probably some protection could be provided to such outputs. We saw that in Ankit Sahani's case as well, the base image and the uh, the style image which was used did not throw up an output which was similar to the earlier style images and the base image. So if that be so, I think there should be some protection which should be granted to the output if it's not a substantial reproduction. Right. Okay. Um, Tanu, this one is for you. Uh, so once an AI tool is deployed by an organization, how do we make sure that each individual user is using the tool appropriately? I think which is a problem in every organization today, I guess. Yeah, this is, you know, one of uh, a very ground level and I would think a very widespread problem at, at this point. Uh, and I do hope that this streamlines eventually as we grow more and get more used to uh, using AI tools. But, you know, just my general thought on this is that uh, I think at this point, uh, you know, AI is reality. It's not something that is too far fetched in the future. Um, and I think from just that standpoint, everyone in the overall ecosystem has a role to play in terms of governance, security and so on. Now, from a, uh, you know, at a more organizational level and how do you ensure that end users or, you know, ground level employees, uh, you know, how are, how do we make sure that they are using it properly? I think the only, the most effective way is to increase awareness, right? To, to focus on awareness uh, of employees, to focus on, and at an individual level, to focus on our self-awareness as well around uh, pitfalls, uh, of using AI and challenges to work around. Uh, from an organizational standpoint, maybe this can be promoted uh, by training programs, right? Uh, and regularly conducting these training programs. I think what happens is that you know you would attend something and you would take back something, and then you know then we've all forgotten about it, which is which is normal, right? But to do this regularly, I think would create just a general culture. Uh, which will evolve around governance um, and awareness. Uh, so I would think that's critical to invest in uh, by organizations today. Um, and then also having uh, systems, uh, you know, which can continuously monitor, uh, you know, the level of usage, the way it's being used, the outcomes that have come, the decisions that have been made and to sort of uh, you know continuously monitor all of this so that uh, if you if you do identify a challenge uh, in the way it is being used uh, at a ground level you can fix it you can change course but you could change course only if there is continuous monitoring and just from that perspective i think uh, you know getting uh, you know a set of experts involved is very uh, crucial Right, people who are skilled to review, skilled to implement, uh, skilled to think of uh, future strategies if something is not working. So there's no one answer to this. It's a holistic approach, uh, approach in terms of increasing awareness, uh, auditing, monitoring, having risk management strategies, and having uh, you know skilled people or consultants who can help you implement this also right so uh, my answer would be that there's no one word answer to this there's no quick fix to this uh, it needs a lot of thought and effort but uh, it will go a long way uh, in mitigating issues right thank you tanu um interesting question uh, for you harsh uh, will ai determine the future landscape of data protection regulations or will it be vice versa <laughs> yeah so uh I think both will evolve slowly. The data protection laws will evolve to take care of uh, AI concerns and AI will help in development of data protection laws as well. So if you look at data protection laws specifically, 
uh, there will be certain areas which relate to AI, which will you will see changing uh, very in, in near future. For example, data minimization concept will become much more robust in future to ensure that AI tools do not unnecessarily use PD where it is not required to use. Wherever AI tools are taking decision about an individual or profiling, you will see that more and more dependence, uh, there will be more and more responsibility on AI tools to ensure it is non-biased, it is without any discrimination. The rights of data subjects will also evolve. They will have a right to know how a particular decision was taken about them. They will have a right to challenge those AI decisions in future. So yes, uh, there will be algorithm transparency that will be required so that the person making an algorithm or the entity responsible for it has to justify why the algorithm is working in a particular manner. And then, of course, cross-border harmonization laws will also play an important role because AI generally works on global data. So AI will uh, slowly, the data protection cross-border transfer laws will also harmonize. And if you look at the other side here, uh, how will AI help development of data protection? I think, as I said in the beginning of my presentation, there will be policy making that the government will do and for that they will get a lot of input from AI tools. It involves a large amount of data to be processed to understand where are the policy issues, where are most of the non-compliances happening and the government will more and more use AI in terms of developing those laws. As far as compliance is concerned, again, a lot of organizations you will see in future will start using AI and AI itself will identify whether a particular consent model is working or not working and trigger consent request as I discussed earlier also. So yes, I think both will have dependence on each other and both will evolve going forward. That, that's my take on this question. Thanks, thanks, sir. Uh, Shailendra, this one is for you. Is it safe to say that if the training data uses material which is in public domain, the AI output can be free of infringement claims? I would say mostly the answer would be yes, but uh, you still need to do those infringement analysis because you never know if the aggregation of the training data, although it may be in public domain, could throw up something which probably infringes, especially in case of trademarks because words, logos, etc. the aggregation could create something which is similar. So infringement analysis is again important. You just can't presume that it will be free of uh, any infringement. Right, right. Um, uh, Harsh, this one is for you. Will consents over OTP or tele mode be considered as consent? So I think this is a question more related to only data protection rather than AI. And uh, so there are uh, existing laws which are under the IT Act which recognize electronic form of consent as well. It's not very prescriptive in terms of how and what all needs to constitute to take an, a valid consent. But yes, electronically, if it is allowed, subject to certain terms and conditions like privacy policy being in place, etc. I think OTP based consent is what we are seeing today is uh, looks like acceptable. I have not seen any enforcement issues in that. But if you look at the new law, which is the Digital Personal Data Protection Act, I think uh, there is a prerequisite that a consent notice is sent first and then the actual consent is taken or rather or both of them can happen together as well. So as long as you are able to satisfy those ingredients in the DPDP Act of consent, uh, I think it will work, but for it to work, there is a requirement that it should be withdrawable. It should explain certain things like purpose and all of that. So I think those ingredients will need to be fulfilled. We will see more of it when the rules are enacted uh, that what should constitute an effective consent notice. And if all of those requirements are fulfilled and then a final acceptance is given through a electronic means, I think uh, it should work. Agree. Um, Shailendra, this question is for you. 
do you feel that the patents act requires amendment to allow of ai inventions certainly i think there's a lot of rigidity when it comes to the software patentability which is where the heart of ai is and i think the open tv case which uh, where justice pratibha singh sent out a direction speaks a lot about that you've seen china having several patent applications being granted and that's there out in the media as well the difference is huge between indian uh, patent grants and the chinese patent grants when it comes to ai i think some bit of leeway is required so that the patentability and encouragement towards such inventions grows right um so i think um, we'll have to bring this to a closure uh, the lot of questions which are coming in and be rest assured we will respond to them offline uh, but um, i think one question let me take which is from pooja and she says amazing presentation do we get this ppt for our future reference let me know and the answer is yes <laughs> you will be getting this presentation along with a copy of this recording pooja um so with this i think uh, i'll i'll move on and let me just uh, talk a little bit about the key takeaways it's been an excellent presentation honestly um yeah so so you know i was just trying to scribble certain inputs which i sort of heard from all of you which i spoke about and there's a long list you have already encapsulated it so well but i'll just give it a shot to pick up some of the points one is that almost all jurisdictions are trying to now regulate ai in their own way and they may have cross border implications as well so we need to be aware of them uh, india is also trying to regulate ai both on a sector neutral and a sector specific basis so we need to be cognizant of this and and ensure that our acts are in consonance of those laws there is obviously a friction between several laws and ai including data protection but there are fixes as well some of them are already there some of them are actually getting built as we as we think about ai development and you know we have this uh, uh, known fact that technology will always perhaps surpass uh, the law making uh, and therefore what we have observed in india is that it's we started with no governance that okay we will not uh, regulate at all to probably some self regulatory uh, you know pro proposition and now we are moving towards Uh, at least some part of it's being of it being regulated and not completely left to non regulation intellectual property aspects is i think we have heard amazing uh, you know leak from from our shailendra probably intellectual property laws amendments are much required now uh, review of terms and conditions of ai tools an absolute necessity um, freedom to operate infringement analysis we heard uh, uh, from you shailendra transactional reps and warranties indemnities covenants uh, it is becoming essential to relook at these uh, it should not just simply pass the master without a spe specialist looking at it um, and finally multi faceted approach uh, for effective ai governance is required all stakeholders need to play a role uh, there has to be a balancing act between innovation uh, entrepreneurship and ease of doing business whilst we are looking at these uh, governance aspects so i think i uh, tried my best to uh encapsulate these uh, i would say a huge gamut of things um so before we move on there'll be a poll i would now request uh, uh so before closing i would like to ask each one of you to respond to this poll slide of your uh, which will be on your screen to provide your feedback on today's webinar we take this very very seriously as part of our continuous improvement program um rajay if you can just put up the poll slide please all i'd request every one of you to please uh, you know participate in the poll it really helps us a lot Great. Uh, thank you so much.
Uh, so thanks to everyone who participated in the poll. And finally, I would like to thank all panel members for sharing their expertise and experience with us today. You were simply, simply outstanding. Thank you once again. Also, thanks to you, our audience, for your attention and your questions. I hope you found this webinar interesting and a worthwhile investment of your time. We certainly enjoyed bringing this to you. After the webinar, we will be sending you a copy of today's presentation, materials, summary notes, and a link to the webinar recording. You will also separately receive a request for your feedback on the webinar. Please take time to send uh, us your feedback, comments, criticism, and even compliments. Uh, the form takes less than one minute to fill up. Um, if you're interested in in-house training or any other matter arising from the webinar, please do not hesitate to contact us. Our contact information is on the contact slide at the end of this webinar. Thank you for your attendance today, and we look forward to being with you again at another in-house council forum. Thank you.